Hello, friendos! The 2.6 trailer version update patch live stream notification thing, whatever you want to call it, is out, which means there are things to talk about. Now, I don't usually do trailer analysis. I usually do them uh, just when I think there's a lot of plot stuff, and this has a lot of plot stuff. So we're going to analyze this from a lore perspective. So we're not going to talk about things like what the new artifact set is good for or anything like that. We're only going to be looking at story and lore implications, all of that kind of stuff. So. I'm gonna try and tackle this somewhat chronologically, and we're only really gonna be looking at the trailer and not the entire live stream for the most part, uh, except for a couple little tiny things. So let's just um, get get started, all right? Let's, let's go. Okay, let's start with the book festival, and yes, I'm gonna call it the book festival, even though it has a proper name, because the proper name makes me all speech slurry, and I don't wanna do it. It seems like the book festival may be hosted by Yai Miko because Yai Miko runs a publishing house. Publishing house could run like a book fair convention thing. Is this like a scholastic book fair? That would be hilarious. Sorry. Um, it does seem like we're gonna be getting some uh, books, maybe some more additional lore about the Raiden Shogun or A or Makoto or all three of them. That would be super cool just because she's on the banners and it does seem like she has some merch all around here. Otherwise, I don't really know why she's on here other than glory to the Shogun, because it's Inazuma, and that feels a little out of place for a book fair. So some fun facts, though. Shingcho is apparently a very popular author in Inazuma, although his books don't seem to be all that popular in Liyue. And he writes light novels, which Yaimiko likes, so that part makes sense. And Albedo is likely here because he illustrates Xing Cho's novels. So I'm very excited to see some interaction between those two. And maybe we're gonna have this little side quest where we help Albedo fill in the blank canvassy things that seem to be all over the place, like these blank posters. Like, why would you have a bunch of blank posters unless you're gonna fill them up, right? And of course, since Albedo is technically in charge of Klee, because Alice put him in charge of Klee, that would explain why Klee is here, because he has to babysit her and he can't really do that from an entire country or two away. And then Venti is shown here, which I also think is kind of odd because I don't think we've seen him since the Windbloom Festival, which was like forever ago, and he's just gonna show up for another random festival in Inazuma. I mean, it does explain why he wasn't at the, you know, the bartending event in Mondstadt, even though that's his country. He is known as being the absentee archon after all, so traveling around, pretty in character. Getting really drunk, also really in character. Is he gonna give us any lore though? That's what I wanna know. Can we bribe him with alcohol into divulging his secrets? Because I would like those. And this would be the perfect opportunity for Venti to interact with A, which I think would be fascinating. Really hoping for that interaction. But really, that's all I have to say on the book fair. I mean, it looks like it's gonna be short, simple, sweet, fun. It's gonna have little mini games and events and a cute little story just like Windbloom did. At least that's what I'm guessing. But my biggest wish for the book festival is that they give me more books. I want more books. Give me more books. Or, or they could release the Pale Princess and the Six Pygmies from Lore Jail. That would be excellent. I would love that. Are you listening, Hoyoverse? Hmm? Anyway, moving on. Let's talk about Ayato. I don't think I'm gonna do a speculative analysis of Ayato specifically because there's so much other content that I just wanna cover. So let me give you kind of like a miniature condensed version of my very speculative analysis of Ayato because I have some fun tidbits for you. Let's start with this constellation. It basically translates into Cyprus Guardian, and a lot of people have gone on to say, hey, that must mean he's referencing Otto from Honkai because he's Ayato, got it? <laughs> no, it doesn't quite work that way. Just because two characters have somewhat of a similar name and may share a voice actor or two doesn't really make them the same character, and it kind of feels like they're grasping at straws and they say, hey, look, he's guarding a tree. Otto has a lot to do with the tree. That makes sense. They must be the same character. I'm not willing to make that leap on that basis, but I digress. Sorry, that was off topic. Let's talk trees. Specifically, let's talk about the Japanese cypress tree, the most common of which is the Hinoki cypress tree. This is an incredibly durable tree. It's resistant to pests like termites and ticks. It resists fungus and rot. And it's because of its immense durability, it's usually used in creating palaces and temples and any sort of building that would be really expensive and they want to last, right? 
In fact, these cypress trees are the reason why so many really, really old historical buildings and temples are still standing in Japan today. It's because that wood is that resistant to degradation. Now, because of its very common use in really prestigious buildings and monumental feats of architecture that involve no nails, by the way, did you know most Japanese temples and like old buildings were not built with nails? They're built with like this really cool method of cutting wood to like create these incredibly strong wood joins that look like puzzles. It's awesome, but it takes so much skill to do. But anyway, the, the prestige that this tree is associated with due to its durable properties results in the tree being highly respected. So if you are ever compared to a cypress tree or anything else around you is compared to a cypress tree, that is considered a compliment. Take it as one, like it's a really big compliment. Now, since the Yashiro Commission, of which the Kamisato clan leads, heads up Inazuma's like cultural division, so to speak, his association with cypress trees then makes sense because cypress trees would have been used to build all of the buildings that do all of the cultural things that he's in charge of, right? In addition to that, while I'm not quite certain whether this following statement actually applies to the Japanese Hinoki cypress specifically, I do know that cypress trees often grow in groves, which in turn provide a habitat for many species of herons. And this is noteworthy because Ayaka's constellation is a heron, so you could kind of interpret Ayato's constellation as representing his role of protecting Ayaka and also their family. So that's pretty cool but it is a little bit different from being the guardian of like some kind of crazy giant cosmic tree of time that Otto would be associated with, although I wouldn't call him a guardian either. You kind of get my point. Now, one thing that falls under the jurisdiction of the Yashiro Commission is swordsmithing, specifically the Raiden Gokuden. The Raiden Gokuden translates directly into the five schools of Raiden, meaning that Raiden was supposedly the one who taught all of these people of Inazuma had to properly forge swords, and then they later split off into five distinct branches of different techniques, so they formed the five schools of Raiden. But three out of five of those schools were completely wiped out by none other than Scaramouche. Yeah, I bet a lot of you didn't see that one coming. I won't go into detail on the reasons why, but I do have a whole video on it if you're interested. There's a link I'll leave somewhere. Um, but anyway, Scaramouche killed these three out of five schools out of uh, revenge. It, it's, it's a little tricky to explain in like a really condensed package, but basically there was a guy like back when Scaramouche woke up like 400 years ago that took good care of him and he was involved with swordsmithing and then he was unjustly killed and then Scaramouche got really bitter and he joined the Fatui and then he came back like 400 years later and then decided he was gonna wipe out three out of five of the clans out of revenge and he was gonna do all five, but apparently he got bored after the third one. That's the TLDR. But I should point out here that the loss of three out of five of the Raiden Gokuden basically is what led to the downfall of the Yashiro Commission. It's not clear exactly when this event took place though, so it could have happened like 400 years ago, it could have happened like 200 years ago, and it could have happened like 30 years ago. My best guess is that it happened like 30 years ago and Scaramouche basically came back from the Fatui and acted to his revenge, or at least like part of it, three fifths of it, <laughs> and then kind of destroyed the Yashiro Commission's reputation. And then Ayaka and Ayoto's parents like freaked out about it and they got really stressed and it kind of weighed on them heavily. And then Ayato here has been picking up the pieces and rebuilding the Yashiro Commission and the Kamasato family's honor, so to speak. So I'm sitting here wondering if Ayato is gonna play some kind of role in either A, giving us information about where the heck Scaramouche went after the Archon quest, or B, play a role in his capture, or C, if we're just going to learn a little bit more about the actual event that took place and what he knows about it. Either way, I get Scaramouche crumbs, I'm happy, and that's all I have for now. Let's move on to the chasm. I'm kind of just going to split this into sensible categories, starting with the portal network. We get introduced to the chasm by Dainsley basically saying, hey, guess what? The Abyss Order seems to have this network of portals and I don't really know how it works, 
but apparently there's one here in the chasm, so if there's one here, then that means that there's a point of interest here for the Abyss Order. So hi, here I am. Did you miss me? It's been since 1.4. Yes, we did. Where have you been? Sorry. Now, it's not clear what kind of portal he's talking about. This could mean a lot of different things, but it is worth noting that all portals in the game kind of have more or less a similar look. For example, the Spiral Abyss is a portal, and the Spiral Abyss portal thingy looks like the one in the Labyrinth event, like when you get to the very end of it. And it also looks like the time tunnels that hover in the sky and warp you across the map, so that could be one of them. And it also kind of looks like the sort of like base of the teleporters. And we use those to warp around, so like that could be a portal too. But the, the thing is, is the portals could also be something completely unrelated that's just using a similar term. Like at the end of the We Will Be Reunited quest, we did see our sibling and the Abyss Herald go through a portal of sorts, and then we couldn't go through that one, but Danesleaf could. So it's possible we're talking about those portals. I'm more tempted to call those like rifts because it looks more like a rift to me than a portal, but I guess a portal network is fine. But it is interesting because it does mean that the Abyss Order can kind of like whip up portals and open up doorways wherever they want to go, kind of like whenever they want to go there, and we don't really know like the restrictions involved in that. So just food for thought. I'm also wondering if Child, since we know he fell into like this crack that landed him in the abyss, I wonder if he fell into like an abyss order crack, like, like a portal, like a fissure. Like he didn't know what it was and he kind of like went through it, but that really wouldn't explain how he went through it because we weren't able to go through it, so we don't really know the laws of how that works. I don't know. I think it's interesting. Anyway, the chasm itself has apparently been under constant mining since about mm, 1,000 years ago, give or take, right? Uh, and mining was part of the reason why Ajdaha went nuts. I mean, he was already kind of on a slippery slope going downhill due to the erosion, but he just went nuts because people were constantly mining in the chasm where he was sleeping and trying to like absorb energy from the ley lines and all the mining operations kind of disturbed the ley lines and then that disturbed Ajdaha and disrupted his whole healing self-sustaining process and then he went ballistic but that was like a thousand years ago there was another incident like 500 years ago that we'll talk about here in a minute but um other than that like there's been continuous mining operations in the chasm for like a thousand or more years, right? But like, I think it was like around a year ago in game time, obviously not like a real year ago. Um, uh, mining operations in the chasm were completely stopped, apparently because there were some weird things going on and they found some stuff. And one of those events seems to be that all the Hillichurls are like going into the chasm and then not coming out. And that's also a little bit weird because they seem to be full of this black, cloudy, corrupted material that looks a lot like the Tataragami. And the Tataragami obviously looks a lot like the black, corrupted-y smoke stuff that comes off of Shao during his burst, and that's the same stuff that, like, gets infected into the monsters that he purges in his story quest, so I kind of think they're the same thing, which would make it kind of like the grudges of fallen gods, but like a weird corrupted energy sort of thing. I don't know. It's odd. They don't explain anything. But it's interesting that the Abyss Order is in the chasm for reasons, and have probably been there for a while, probably like a year. And the Abyss Mages are often seen summoning or manipulating hilly churls. And so since they are both going into the chasm or are already in the chasm, I'm going to suspect the Abyss Order is probably at fault for whatever's happening to the Hillitrolls. Now, later in the trailer, we do see a few Hillitrolls that, you know, Dane's Leaf in the trailer are kind of just standing over and staring at, like, hey, dude, what you doing? And they're just chilling. They're just chilling in this ancient upside down city, which we'll also talk about in a little bit. And I'm kind of sitting here wondering if if the Hillichurls here might actually be like the original residents of this city that was down here. And they're like trying to go home. But that would be super weird and really sad. And I I kind of hope they don't go that route. But that would that would be really sad. Anyway, one of the other reasons that the chasm probably shut down uh, was because of the discovery of the ruined serpent. So that the big mechanical snaky thing, yeah? I understand why no one would want to mine with that thing just kind of rampaging through there. You get stuck in a landslide or a, a cave-in and you are screwed. There is no one that can help you, you know? 
but what's not clear to me is whether or not the discovery was just like, this thing just showed up one day. Cause you know, like the Abyss Order just kind of showed up and they brought it with them to like dig tunnels and, and make like a tunnel network that they could work through. Or if some miner, some really unfortunate miner like dug up the serpent and then accidentally activated it and then it went nuts and he's like, oh no. And then he ran away. Like, I don't know which one it is, but it's probably one of the two. And speaking of miners, I don't know if most of you know this, but there will be a lot of treasure hoarders here, and we can see that because their tent is set up down here at the bottom of the mine. In addition, apparently, treasure hoarder crushers, so the ones with the hammers, those were all apparently previous miners from the chasm that were put out of work because the chasm shut down. And now I feel really bad for them. Now here's a terrible segue back to talking about the Yakshas and the black corrupted -y stuff that's coming off the Hillatrils. Around 500 years ago, during the Cataclysm, there was like this big influx of monsters that came out of the chasm and like a bunch of other horrible stuff went down, right? Now we know that prior to this, the Yaksha or the five Yaksha of which Shao is one, uh, they were summoned by Morax to kind of cleanse the land of all this bad juju. Mm -hmm. And most of them didn't make it, only Xiao made it. But, but these weren't the only Yakshas, these are just like five of the strongest Yaksha. There was another Yaksha that we know in the lore community as the Nameless Yaksha that had abandoned their responsibilities and then just kind of vanished for a while. But this Nameless Yaksha returned when a bunch of monsters started pouring out of the chasm around 500 years ago during the Cataclysm. And that Yaksha, along with the people of Dunyu tried to protect the settlement at Dunyu. In theory, they all died there. Now it's not entirely clear if this Yaksha is a completely separate Yaksha or if it could be one of the other four Yaksha that survived beyond Shao. but the new artifact set, the Vermilion Hereafter, might shed some light on that topic. It's a set that's custom made for Xiao. Name me one other character that this will be best in slot for. Really, like it's not best in slot for anyone else unless you're talking about a two piece, in which case, yeah, okay, that's an attack percent, it's fine. But the point is the four piece set is made for Xiao, who is a Yaksha. And the headpiece of this set is identical to the one that the Electro Yaksha wore. And the Electro Yaksha is the one that is suggested to have not died from corruption and may have just kind of poofed for a while, you know? And what would be really cool is if we, you know, get some lore on him or we get some lore on the Nameless Yaksha or both, if they're the same one, that would be great. But what I would really like is crumbs that the La Yaksha, this little guy, the purple dude, might be playable because, because he has four arms, which is awesome, and he's buff, which is awesome. And I want a big buff four-armed Yaksha that constantly loses HP in my party. It sounds awesome. I want to punch things. It's a futile dream. I know, but let me dream. Let me dream. But on a less opium topic, uh, light falling into the chasm is weird. Although I can't really tell if this is like straight up light energy or if it's like geo energy, you know what I mean? Like it could be either or, and I'm kind of torn between the two because the coloring is too similar. But hey, maybe that's the point, I don't know. I'm kind of leaning more towards this is like straight up light energy, but that's because of something we'll talk about a little bit later. But the effect itself, the way the light is falling into the chasm, reminds me a lot about the light that circles around the Skyfrost Nail in Dragonspine, and it also reminds me of the light that spirals around the Narukami Shrine, and it reminds me of the lights that spiral into the uh, portal that takes us to Enkanomiya. I think it's very interesting when and where these kind of light spirally things show up. They feel like they're all in really suspicious locations. Interestingly, with the exception of the chasm, although we could make this argument for the chasm too, uh, the th three other locations all have interesting Irminsul trees there. Like we've got the, um, the frost-bearing tree and dragon spine. That's a weird Irminsul tree, we know that. Uh, there's another one in Narukami, right? The big fox-shaped head tree, that's an Irminsul tree, or at least if it's not, I'm going to be very shocked. 
And then we also have the tree, well, I don't know if you can really call it a tree, but there's like the Helios, right? The Dainichi Mikoshi in Enkanomiya, which during the event gained branches. Although it looks like coral branches and coral isn't really a tree, but I guess technicalities here because in the chasm, we have something that looks a lot like an Irminsul tree, but it's a mushroom. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So I think it's interesting that the light is like that. I thought about the possibility that the Abyss Order could be responsible for the light going down into the chasm, but because we see this kind of light at three other locations, albeit in different colors, I'm starting to wonder if the Abyss Order is here because of the light flowing in and not necessarily that they are responsible for it. We'll talk about that in a bit too. But note how in this shot, the rocks here are just like they are in Enkanomiya and in Domains. They're just kind of like hovering in midair when they should be falling. I'm starting to think that these things hover because they can't really decide whether they're going up or down and therefore they just don't do either. Like there's some sort of weird barrier place where gravity kind of reverses itself and at that point you just kind of like float. Like if you merged three planets kind of like worlds together and the grav the point of gravity like it's moving towards is at the core of each of those worlds and you squish like two worlds together like where they collide is where gravity would kind of like be really funky and would like reverse on itself so maybe things just kind of exist in that space and they don't go in either direction they're just like in stasis now that I say it out loud, it sounds both really stupid and kind of like an interesting idea because we already know about the light realm and the void realm and the human realm and maybe these civilizations that are all like floaty and stuff are on the barriers between these worlds and that's why time is standing still because it doesn't know which direction to go. Uh, food for thought for another video, I guess. Anyway, moving on to this light seal thing, which is made up of a couple of heptagrams and a bunch of lines that make it look like there's a sun in the middle. This seal is just screaming with Zhongli's aesthetic. It's just written all over these boxy, designy, doodad little thingies all around the edges, you know? It seems kind of reasonable to link it to him, but depending on where this seal is, it may have been placed within the last year, or it could have been placed like a thousand years ago, or even 500 years ago to prevent like more monsters coming out from the bottom. You know, so it's, it's a little hard to place it time-wise. There's a lot of possibilities. The way the shots are set up in the order, like the way the camera is moving, it looks like this seal is very close to the entrance of the chasm but I'm actually inclined to think this is like way deeper in the chasm. Like it's at the heart of the chasm. We gotta bust through it or something. And maybe we have to bust through it to like let the abyss order in, albeit accidentally. Like maybe we think they're on the other side, but they're not and they use us to get like through there. But at the same time, if they have a portal network, maybe they can just or open like a portal on the opposite side of it. And like we have to break through this barrier in order to get at them. And then that's kind of like our, you know, progress stopper thing that we need Danes' help for. I don't know. I, I, I'm just thinking this is probably not at the entrance. I'll be kind of surprised if it is. Although if it is like somewhere in the middle, maybe this barrier is kind of what's blocking the mining operations of the chasm off from like all of this Enkonomia-ish upside down city stuff. That's possible. That could be like a fail safe. Like we're sealing this area away. Here's the barrier doorway thing that you can't get through, but haha, ha, just kidding, you can totally get through this because you're the traveler and you have plot armor. You can do whatever you want. But speaking about this upside down city, which has architecture that looks just like Enkonomiya's and therefore is placed at not only the same time period, but the same civilization, it's worth noting that Enkonomiya just kind of sank, whereas if this city is upside down, it would have been flipped, which is kind of funny when you think about it. It also means that Enkonomiya was not the only thing that sank, and we had suspicions about this, but we couldn't really confirm it. So here we go, now we're confirming it. There's more civilizations under the ground that kind of, you know. But it doesn't really seem like anyone lives here, and I don't think we're gonna see, you know, sin shades down here. That was like an Enkonomiya specific thing. At least we think so. It'd be kind of interesting if it wasn't and we got more lore on the God of Time, or at least, you know, the God of Moments. But, but I have I have a question. See, if this city is upside down, 
and most of it does seem to be, then how are we walking upright in it in a few of these shots? Like, do we get anti-gravity and we get to like flip upside down and then suddenly we walk on the ceiling and the whole camera flips with us? Or is it that like some of the city is upside down but then some of it is not? Or, or, or are we gonna like flip the whole city upside down? Cause that sounds fun. That sounds cool. Or are we just gonna like travel through like what are those painting portal things again and end up on the other side and like on that side, the whole city is right side up. Most of those options sound pretty sick. Not gonna lie. Just the one that, you know, doesn't involve flipping around. That that one doesn't sound so sick, but that I, I'm thinking about that. I am thinking about that. I am thinking about like, Zelda in Twilight Princess when you got like the iron boots and you could like flip upside down onto the magnet and just like a woo and then walk around on the roof of the mines. That was so much fun. We can't do that in here. But it would be cool if we could. But of course, Dane's Leaf doesn't talk about that. He just talks about, you know, like other things. And then while he's talking, like there's a big giant shroom on the screen, which is weird because this shroom looks a lot like an ear minstrel tree if you like ignore the cap. Like if you just take away the cap, it looks exactly like a petrified tree, which is super weird because these are trees. But what if they're not trees? What if the ear minstrel trees are not actually trees? What if they're not supposed to be trees? What if they're supposed to be mushrooms? Like that could be a thing. And it would explain the ley line network. Cause see, trees aren't usually connected to each other. Not, not really, like not naturally, like, unless you're an aspen tree or something, which is technically just one tree that has like a lot of roots that are all connected and like a lot of branches that come up like, but the largest organism in the world is actually a mushroom. It's like a giant network of fungus that exists under the ground, right? Like that network is typically called like a mycelium network. And that is really cool. That does connect plants and trees to each other, by the way, even though it's a fungal network, it's like this cool symbiotic relationship that they have. And, that would kind of explain the whole ley line network kind of phenomenon. It's kind of like a, a magical mycelium network. But I just, uh, the, the idea that mushrooms would be connected to ley lines instead of trees kind of hurts my head because fungus and mushrooms, they're not plants, but they're not animals, but they're, they're not, they're, they're, they're their own thing. They're own like third life form type. It's cool. I like it. But anyway, the, the point here I was trying to make is that this looks like a lot like a ley line tree. So is this like the chasm's frost bearing tree kind of thing? Because it seems like it. It looks like it. And Earman soul trees kind of come in two colors. They come in gold and they come in blue. And I'm not talking about the frost bearing trees. I know that one's red. It's okay. That one's corrupted by durian. We're gonna ignore that one. It's an offshoot. But if you go into like the domains and you look at a petrified tree, they start out blue. And then when you feed them resin, they turn gold, right? So the two colors here on this mushroom kind of just like, they, they make sense to me. Make sense to me as an ear minstrel tree. Anyway, that's my long little rant on mushrooms. And it, there's a little, little, little tiny mushroom boy. Look at the little shroomies. Like if it's a new enemy, I'm, I'm gonna be sad because I don't want to squish it. It looks so cute. And moving on to really weird things that are in Dragonspine and also probably found in the chasm, we've got another instance of a Skyfrost nail. But this one's covered in black corruption-y smoky stuff, which means that it's very possible that the Abyss Order is doing something funky to the nail. Why do they need the nail? I'm not sure. Why would they go to the one in the chasm over the one that was in Dragonspine originally? Because the Dragonspine one was a hell of a lot easier to get to. I'm just saying. But the weird thing about this nail is that there are like, cubes coming off of it, like white cubes that are just like spooling off the sides of it, wherever the smoke isn't, you know? But even weirder than the little white cubes that are coming off of it, if you look really close in a couple of these scenes, you're gonna notice some black cubes, but these just aren't any cubes that are black. These are cubes that are black and red. And you know what else has cubes that are black and red? The sustainer of heavenly principles. She's got black and red cubes with little eyeballs on them. And honestly, I don't really know what to make of that. I don't know if there's any connection, but I do think it's interesting because the sustainer of heavenly principles has this like black cubicle uh, effect that kind of sprinkles up her arm 
for lack of a better term. And you do have to wonder if she is perhaps corrupted in some way, and that's why she has these QB things, and that's why the nail is like that, because maybe the abyssal corruption got to it, and it can get to her too, and maybe that's the whole problem. Maybe Susti is just corrupted, and that's why everything's going funky. Who knows? I just think it's weird. I'm pointing it out. Moving on. Now, I have seen some people say that this domain that shows up in this scene is going to be like a non-domain domain, like a domain arena, but like in the overworld. And I don't think that's what this is. I'm sorry. I think this is just a normal domain where the new artifacts will be. There's nothing really to see here. They did this back in 2.0, you know, like they showed us the new domains and they just happen to look a lot more like domains and not a lot like the rest of, you know, the island. But remember that Solvindignir's domain looks a heck of a lot like Solvindignir just underground, like in the cave area. So I'm pretty convinced this is not a place we can just visit in the overworld. Like we're going to have to go through a domain door to get here. Now let's talk about this big topic, which is probably the reason why most of you are watching this video. And I'm sorry I made you sit through 30 minutes of me talking about random things in order to get here. But hey, here we are. Let's talk about Dane's Leaf and the Abyss Order and whatever the heck they're doing down here because what is going on? Now, first off, I want to point out that this Abyss Lector here appears to be holding or hovering. Uh, what do you call that when you're like holding something but not holding something because it's like hovering in your hands? We don't have a word for that because it's not physically possible. Anyway, hovering in front of this Lector is a gold diamondy looking thing. And the weird thing about this and the reason why I bring it up is because it looks a heck of a lot like the Traveler's Ascension material, the brilliant diamond. It's the same color and I think it's a pretty convincing shape. From the looks of it, it has less sides than our final gemstone that we use for the max ascension for the Traveler, but it's still interesting that it's the same color, same general shape, like it's it's all of that kind of stuff. And the power that comes out of it is this big goldy burst of lady thingamabobbiters. And it looks a lot like the light that comes off of the Traveler whenever we have one of those big, huge story time moments, like when we fought Osile or when we fought Raiden, right? Like we had that big release of gold energy. So I kind of call that just Traveler energy, right? So I think that's really interesting here. What I don't know is what the heck is hovering over the Traveler's head because it's like this, this thing that is also glowing. Is that supposed to be like that rock light lamp thing that we're supposed to get in order to walk through the chasm and not have it be pitch dark outside? Is that what that is? Is it just like hover over our head like some really weird flashlight? Or is it a cool item that like might be something Danes gave us in order to detect the Abyss Order or something? Cause that would be neat. But whatever's happening with this big golden energy flux that's coming out of this brilliant diamond, or at least like being channeled through this gemstone core thingy, it seems to have a very negative effect on Dane's leaf, which is interesting in and of itself because Dane has this like dark blue murky power to him that we saw in, you know, 1.4 during his quest when he kind of like did the Jedi chokehold on the Abyss Herald. It's noteworthy because like I mentioned, Earman soul trees come in two colors. They come in dark blue and they come in gold. So Dane's Leaf's little veins and markings all over his body do look a lot like the glowing veins that we see all over, you know, things that are have the, the ley lines in them. Like we usually associate those veins with ley lines, but he seems to be associated with the blue ley lines and not the gold ley lines. So you gotta wonder if those two sort of states of being are at odds with each other. But the light from the core doesn't just affect Dane's Leaf. It also affects both the Hillichurls and the husk enemies, which is kind of odd when you think about it, because I've always kind of thought of Dainsleaf as being more of an Abyss Lector Herald kind of thing than I have thought about him being a husk, but it seems like he might have more in common with the husks than the Lector, because the Lector does not seem to be all that affected by whatever it is that he's doing, and maybe he's got like a special protective thing, who knows, maybe he has like, you know, the Abyss Princess's or Prince's blessing. But now I'm sitting here wondering if Dane's Leaf was actually supposed to turn into something more like the husk entity, but was somehow managed to, you know, stave off that degradation. And maybe he's still gonna eventually turn into one of those one day. Maybe that's inevitable. Maybe he's just buying himself some time. That's kind of a dark thought. 
And while Dane does look like he's in a lot of pain, because, haha, <laughs> pain's leaf, um, I don't think he asks us to stop the procedure, uh, because he's in pain. It seems like whatever's being done is actually bad for more than just him. Now, the light explosion from the little prism thing shoots upward onto a stone tower that looks quite a bit like those light actuator tower thingies. That's not their real name, I forget their real name. But those light tower things from the Enkonomiya event. Remember those? They had like the little light medallion thing on the bottom and then it kind of like shot light eventually towards the, um, towards the Dainichi Mikoshi. That thing. I'm wondering if this is a similar thing, but like with an upside down city. But then you have to ask yourself, why then did Enjo, right? Why, why did he want to turn those things off, but this one wants to turn these things on? Like, d it, it, you have to turn off the switches in different area to get power to flow in different ways? Like, what's the deal here? I don't understand. Well, food for thought, whatever it is. But the thing that bothers me the most about this entire thing is, why are we underwater? Like, why, why are we underwater? We are underwater. No, we're in the chasm, but we are underwater. So did we like migrate from the chasm all the way into the sea? Or is there like an underground river in the chasm and like somehow it's hovering over our heads because that makes sense because this city is partially submerged in this underground thing. But it looks like light is coming through it, which makes me think that this has to be close to the surface somewhere. But if it's close to the surface, then where is the city sitting on? You know what I mean? Like, is that not weird? Is it not weird that we're underwater and that we're shooting light into a pillar that's coming out of the water? I think that's weird. I think that's really weird. I don't know what's going on, guys. I know you came here for an analysis, but it's really just me freaking out saying, I don't know what's going on. Please help me. But uh, it's been 35 minutes of me rambling, so I, I think I'm just gonna head off and not think about this for the next few days and just get really, really, really excited when the chasm drops. I am going to do so much exploring. I am excited. Let me know what you guys think. Did I miss anything? Is there anything else that you're thinking about? Did I, did I spark any uh, points of interest in your brain? Did I prod your brain? That's my question. Put it in the comments. Did I prod your brain? Yes or no? If I did, put in whatever came out of the prodding. I want to hear it. All right, guys, thanks so much for watching. I'll catch you guys next time. Bye-bye.